Hello and thanks for joining us here at Encore. Coming up in today's show. We dive into the wordless world of the red turtle, a laid back yet thrilling animated gem. And vacationing, it's a genre all its own in French cinema, but relaxing can be hard work. Plus, three documentaries shot by the late Chris Marker in ex-Yugoslavia. We look at the Balkan trilogy. Well, today I'm joined by France 24's film critic Lisa Nesselson. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Molly. Today we're going to uh, take a look at uh, The Red Turtle. Now, this is an animated feature that premiered at the Cannes Film Festival, and it's been getting a lot of attention. Now, I understand it's a Franco-Japanese co-production. Tell us more. Uh, this is not by any means of the imagination just for animation fans. This is a movie movie that happens to be animated. It's gorgeous. It's lilting. It is downright surreal. It's really bizarre, odd. It was years in the drawing. And I think it's suddenly taken on a little more relevance uh, in the wake of the Brexit vote because it's a, about a guy who gets uh, stranded on an island and he's forced to cope with all sorts of sudden challenges to survive under considerable duress. Uh, in the opening sequences, we see him struggling not to drown in incredibly roiling seas. You forget right away that you're watching something hand-drawn because it's so convincing. And uh, he wakes up on the beach of an island and uh, he's supple, he's resourceful, he has no plans to stay there indefinitely. He shakes uh, fruit from trees, he, st he gets some fish, he builds a raft with uh, foliage for a sail, sets out, he does not want to stay there. But every time he gets a little bit offshore, there's a very uh, pr pronounced thump from below that smashes his raft to smithereens. And about 25 minutes into the story, uh, the title creature appears. That is a uh, very giant red turtle, red shell, red flippers. And the man sees to it that the turtle is not going to interfere with his next raft, but the vanquished turtle uh, eerily turns into something else, opening up the possibility for companionship, and an ethereal courtship ensues. And I have to point out, there's not a single line of dialogue, but that is absolutely it, it not It doesn't make it fall flat with no, it, absolutely no words. Absolutely not, because there's a very brilliant score and wonderful sound effects. And there's also also a lot of uh, comic relief from these little sand crabs who scuttle in and out sideways and sort of observe what's going on and scuttle out again. It is quite simply thoughtful and moving animation. Uh, and uh, this was um, Michael Dudak DeWitt, the animator, is the first foreigner to ever have been uh, approached by uh, Japan's famous studio Ghibli because they saw in his uh, brush strokes uh, and the way he, he uses ink and design uh, some Japanese influences. How, how much did music play a role in here and to keep things moving? Uh, it, everything is just perfectly melded. I, I don't know how they did it, but, but it all sort of works. Um, so uh, it's about the passage of time and the power and the indifference of nature. Let's take a look. So, well, from the sublime to uh, the ridiculous, if you can say <laughs> that. Also out this week, we've got Camping 3. It's a French comedy uh, with an all-star cast set in a very typical French campground. Uh, and uh, if it's like its pre predecessors, it's certainly going to be a big hit. Why is this? I wish I could explain that. I haven't seen this one yet, but I have to say the first one 10 years ago in 2006 really was very funny and entertaining. It was a smash. A snobbish Parisian man and his daughter in their sports car broke down in the middle of nowhere, and they were forced to interact with ordinary French people. It was very comical. There are two things to keep in mind. First of all, vacation time is absolutely sacred here in France. Also, our viewers outside France may assume that most French films are sort of in intellectual dramas with a with a serious component. And I have to point out that an enormous number of French movies are actually very lowbrow, borderline to truly crass comedies. And even if word of mouth is bad, people still flock to them and they make a lot of money. All right, well, let's take a look now. Miriam Saba has more on Camping 3. You 
Monsieur Chirac est demandé à l'accueil. Swim trunks have never looked this good. Pitching for laughs at the Flop Bleu camping site, the hit French comedy has Patrick Chirac, played by Frank Dubosc, and the gang back on old turf, playing up new antics. Si y a un problème, je suis là. Non, c'est bon, je le connais. On s'est dit que comme le covoiturage s'était plutôt bien passé, peut-être qu'on pourrait partager votre pente. Ouais, un covoiturage, quoi. Ouais, voilà. Ten years after the first installment, the third film breaks in the next generation of campers. On démarre son bol, on lave son bol, on range son bol. Et bien évidemment, à qui Ici, pas de drogue. The coming of age comedy proves that to be young is to be young at heart. Vous êtes des jeunes. Patrick, il est 18h. We don't want to hide. To hide would be a bit pathetic. No, we want to laugh, and through the young people in our cast, we want to assume to laugh at what our characters have become. Three young playmates are along for the ride, who, like their characters, discover camping in all its glory. I'm not used to listening to old school singers like Demis Roussos. I discovered a whole new world with Camping 3. It's the unknown. Lights out means a party in the streets, while for others it's time to hit the sheets. Hey Patrick, t'as pas des feuilles? It was in the Bay of Arcachon that the cast and crew first premiered the film for audiences. It's fresh. It reminds me of time spent with friends and outings that we've shared. It's more dynamic. It's cool. Part one drew six million spectators, part two, four million. Only time will tell if the latest film will see the camping franchise hit with the sting of a summer burn or bask in the glow of box office gold. All right, well, let's switch gears now. Next, Lisa, the late uh, Chris Marker made quite a few films uh, that uh, have fit a certain description. Now out on DVD are three documentaries that he shot in ex-Yugoslavia, released as the Balkan Trilogy. Uh, tell us more about Marker and, and really why he matters. Well, you may not be familiar with his name, but I have to say he made one of the most important and influential films of all time. I'm not exaggerating. That's not hyperbole. It's called La Jete, and it lasts just 28 minutes. But once you've seen it, it lasts a lot. Lifetime. It's set in the future after the Third World War destroys Paris, and it's the story told almost entirely via still photographs of a man who is sent back in time to save humanity. Uh, something else happens. Terry Gilliam actually expanded Marker's astonishing 1962 28-minute short into the very effective feature 12 Monkeys, which you may have seen uh, starring Bruce Willis. That was in 1995. Marker explored what film and video could do right up until his death at the age of 91 on his 91st birthday, in fact, in uh, 2012, which brings us to the Balkan Trilogy, three documentaries made in 1993, 1995, and 2000. Now, La Jete, which I just mentioned, was an imaginary war. The harrowing wars in the Balkans broke out 45 years after the end of World War II, right here in Europe, you know, just a few hours flying time from unscathed and kind of indifferent European capitals. And it's worth mentioning that Sarajevo endured the longest siege in modern history, and that ethnic cleansing became a sort of matter-of-fact term that we were all using. So. Uh, uh, the one that I like the most of these three, I think, is called the 8 o'clock news in the camps. Marker shows us Bosnian refugees in a camp in Slovenia who defiantly and creatively try to make their own evening news program just for themselves. This isn't actually telecast, but they go around and uh, they, they steal off satellite feeds, uh, CNN, the BBC, and then they comment on what's actually happening to them and how they view it with jingles, with, uh, with uh, all, all the uh, accoutrements. Uh, there's also one about uh, a guy who was a, a UN peacekeeper and one about the mayor in Kosovo whose uh, bridge separated the Albanians from the Serbians. You can buy the DVD or you can get it on video on demand on the cultural channel Arte. All right, that's the Balkan trilogy. Uh, now next, Lisa, we've got in honor of the 20th anniversary since his death, one of the most uh, important films made by Polish director Krzysztof Kozlowski. Uh, it's being re-released here in France, but the Decalogue, that's what it's titled, uh, it's no ordinary film. <laughs> Is it really uh, one reason that being it takes about five trips to see it in its entirety? It does indeed. I'm incredibly excited about this. I'm going to play film professor a little today. First, Chris Marker and now Chris Kozlowski. Christoph Kozlowski. I sometimes get what, asked uh, what my favorite films are, and uh, I can say that watching the Decalogue, this 10-part film inspired by the Ten Commandments, with each story running 55 minutes, actually changed my life as a film goer. It is a 20th century masterpiece. It just happens to require 562 minutes to watch, but again, it'll reward you for a lifetime. When Kozlowski and his co-screenwriter 
were wondering whether they should tackle the Ten Commandments. Um, they didn't know whether it was right to do that because even people who break them sort of agree that they're, they're essential and sacred, and Poland is an overwhelmingly Catholic country. But it's wrong to categorize this as difficult or overly intellectual because it was destined to be shown to the general public in prime time on Polish TV, and when it was shown, about a third of the population, that's about 15 million people, tuned in. Um, I don't know how Kozlowski achieved what he did, but it's mystical, downright addictive storytelling. The characters all live in the same apartment building in Warsaw, and we get to eavesdrop on their lives and their dilemmas. Each installment is incredibly rich. There are characters that overlap. There's moral dilemmas. There's twists of fate. Uh, he worked with nine different cinematographers to give it a slightly different look. And if you prefer to get your film recommendations, not from me, but from celebrities, uh, I attended in 1999 the Paris Press Conference for Eyes Wide Shut, which was Stanley Kubrick's final film. And Nicole Kidman and Tom Cruise, the stars who were married at that time, they ended up spending way more time in England with Kubrick than they meant to. Uh, and somebody asked them, well, weren't you bored? And they said, absolutely not. Stanley showed us the best movies. Like what? And they were very, very high on the Decalogue. So if you're lucky enough to be here in Paris, they're going to have real philosophers leading debates and discussions after every film. And uh, you can also get it uh, this September. It will be coming out on DVD in the U.S. if you're not in Paris. All right, excellent. Well, Lisa, thank you very much for a look at that weekly uh, cinema wrap for that and for more. You can always head to our website. We're also on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you for joining us. We're going to end now with a look at Krzysztof Kozlowski's Decalogue. Here you go. The news continues here on France 24. Thank you.